Clay Thompson was finally on the uh, on the podcast with Draymond Green. I was kind of grappling with that a lot this year. It's almost like your own, own mortality as an athlete. Like, man, I might not be able to elevate like I once did, or I might not slide my feet left and right like I once did, but I can still be a heck of a player if I just give gratitude and keep that perspective. Like, I'm out here balling because that was hard for me these last few years when you're, uh, when you go through injuries and you're so used to playing at a certain level, guarding a certain guy, shooting certain shots, then you have to adjust all of that. That was the hardest part of my career. And it's still hard for me, you know, when I'm used to scoring 25 and a quarter, locking up the best player. Now I got to be pick my spots a lot more just precisely, which is fine. I've finally come to accept like, look, I can still be a heck of a player. I can still be incredibly efficient as long as I'm having fun and being a good teammate. And you actually helped me a ton when you're like, lean into these young guys, lean into the fact you're a vet, you made X amount of money. You don't have to worry about nothing. Like you're playing for the love of the game. And I think once I realized that and I relax a little bit rather than trying to play for a contract or an all-star nod or some accolade, but rather just play for the love of the game. And the fact they get to play cards with the guys on the plane, we're playing ping pong last night after the game. We're having fun. That's the beauty of the game right there. Not trying to get another max deal or another endorsement, but just smelling the roses and appreciating all the work it get, took to get here. You know why I buy what he's saying? And, um, and and maybe you're like, well, wait a minute. Why is this even something where you would say, you know, you're, you're buying it or selling it? I, you could listen to that, and we know. We know what Clay Thompson has been through the last few years with the Warrior fan base. There are good weeks, bad weeks, good months, bad months. And a lot of times when people have taken shots at him, not just for shot selection, but also just this idea of, like, ego taking over you're not willing to go to the bench you're going to bench me these press conferences stuff like that um okay okay let's take all this i want to mention this the fact that clay's even doing this i think is the only answer you need there are not a lot of athletes who will sit down and go there have a conversation like this and try to just get real with the fans and be like, look, I'm dealing with, there's mental health aspects to this. Um, there's my wellness. There's my, there's my future. There's my standing. This is where my head is and has been. And not everybody shares that. So I just want to point that out. I really appreciate that Clay is finally sitting down to have this conversation. And this isn't to take a shot at people who don't, but like compare this to Andrew Wiggins. Just do that for yeah, a second. We've heard nothing from him about anything. The fact that Clay is willing to share this with everybody, I think speaks pretty well for where he's actually at on all of it. Yeah, and he laid out exactly where he is and where he's getting to, and he thanked Draymond for helping him get to that place where he's not out there chasing a max. He's just trying to stay in the moment, enjoying the fact that he's still one of the great basketball players in the world right now. He may not be as good as he was, he probably won't be ever as good as he once was due to age and injury and all the rest of it. But he sounded to me in that clip like a guy who is at peace with where he is and where this team is. And, you know, whether or not that means he'll come back and be a warrior next year or not, that's yet to be decided in the offseason. But it sounds to me like he would be more open than I thought to coming back and, and just appreciating what he was talking about there, like, playing cards on the plane and playing ping pong after the game and being around guys who know him and people who he knows, there's a certain comfortability being in a spot for 10 or 11 years and playing alongside the same two guys for 10 or 11 years and the same head coach now for 9 or 10 years. All those things you can't put a price tag on. Let, let, let me ask you this. And 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 let's let's leave our own rule for a second because I've been and we've been like look let's let's stay in the moment right you got the Lakers tomorrow night you got playing stuff I don't want to do the off season yet I don't know when the off season's coming but give me the scenario where Clay's not on the Warriors next year because I I don't even know if it exists it would be a multi year deal where he makes more money than what the Warriors are willing to pay him. Maybe he gets a deal for three and ninety somewhere, and maybe it's the Clippers or the Lakers. I don't know what their salary cap room is like, but for me, it would be a contract that is more years and more money than what the Warriors would be willing to extend. 
That's the scenario. I don't think that he would go to a bottom feeder team for more money. Okay. I think he would be going to a, a competitive team, a good team that would allow him to to play the way he plays here. But you mentioned the LA teams, and I get the connection there. Yeah. But those teams that they're filled with big names, and I don't think that there's a whole lot of salary room. Yeah. I mean, look at the Clippers. You got Harden, and you got George, and I know George is a free agent, and all that stuff, and. Um, but Kawhi and, and Westbrook and the Lakers with all of their bloated stuff and everything. I look at, I had this conversation with someone recently about Draymond when people was like, who, who, who's one? Now he's not a free agent, but who would want Draymond? And I'm like, okay, look around the league and understand that right now the NBA has a good handful of teams that are good enough to be playoff teams, but they don't really have the experience and they're trying to get better, but but do it quickly. They're trying to get better and do it quickly. I mean, Minnesota is one of these teams. Oklahoma City is one of these teams. New Orleans is one of these teams. Go to the East, where Cleveland and Orlando and even the New York Knicks, these are these teams. Grandy was just whispering in my ear when you were talking. What's the team you like, uh, uh, Mark? That's what you were talking, Orlando. Orlando. They need shooting, and they have a ton of money to spend. Okay. But even if you said 3-90... and 90, if the Warriors are over here and they go, hey, uh, two and fifty with a with a third year option to make it three and seventy five. If you're Clay, and, and maybe the answer is yes, are you taking that after everything you've made? And I know even incredibly rich people like making more money, and there's ego involved. I understand this. I'm not new to sports. But I, ju- I don't understand that idea if I'm Clay Thompson. If it comes down to 15 or $20 million over three years, I'm going to uproot no more Boat, no more Tiburon, no more Steph, no more Dre, no more Steve. I'm going to go play with Ben Caro in Florida. They got water in Florida. They got water. I don't see it. I wouldn't. Yeah, and just listening him. to that that sound clip from the Draymond Green podcast makes me think more along the lines of what you're laying out there. If it comes down to that, and $15 million is a lot of money, even for a pro athlete. It's a ton of money. But I, I think it comes down to the respect and the comfortability of being here in Golden State. I do think that that's worth a lot of money for any athlete, but especially Clay, who has only played alongside Steph and Draymond his whole career. And he's played for Steve Kerr for almost all of his career, except for a couple of early years with Mark Jackson. And like you said, he likes it here. He's won here. He's a legend here. There's so much about being here that's worth more than money. So if it comes down to to just $15 million, which, again, he's made more than $240 million in his career, so that really is kind of a smaller sum, but it might come down to respect. If he's, you know, if the Warriors are offering him twenty five million a year, maybe he's making less than Draymond, and he's making the same as Wiggins. There's a certain amount of of ego that goes into sure. this. Beyond, do you need the money? Of course, he doesn't need the money, but there is the ego part of it. If you wind up being the fifth highest paid player on your team, well, of course. Um, although it sounds to me like he's done a whole lot of work on his ego yeah. and the way that yep. things hit him. Um, just this year, you know, to go from, dude, you're going to bench me to accepting a role off of the bench and having a conversation like this with Draymond Green in a public space. I think he's done a lot of work on this. And um, and then I also think this. Look at it. Forget Clay's perspective. Let's go to the team's perspective. Go to the Warriors. Um, I just feel like through the years, every single time, They've had a glimmer, a slight opening, any chance at all to not support the idea of the big three. They say no. Every single time. I have the hardest time, no matter how this season ends. I know that the 10 seed, they could lose in nine days in L.A. or Sacramento, and it'll be just a sweep them out with the, uh, with the trash type of a feel to it. And I still think that the, quote, big changes that the Warriors will try to make will likely not include those three because 
every time it's in question, they go that way. They lean into those three people. But they will be at a point that they haven't been in the entire 10-year trajectory of the big three. It's true. They will have lost in a play-in scenario again. And Clay is going to be a free agent. And he's making 43.2. And you're not paying him 43.2. You don't want to pay him 33.2. You'd probably be okay paying him 23.2. And I don't know if Clay would be willing to, to play for that number. And all we heard from Joe Lacob is that he absolutely wants to get underneath the tax. And when you look at what that number is going to be for next year, it's right about $170 million. And right now, if you look at what they have on their books for next year without Clay, it's $174 million. Now, that includes $30 million for Chris Paul. So you take that out, and you've got about twenty five or $26 million left. So if Clay's willing to play for that, then it might work, and then you're just going to run it back. I don't even know about that. Like, I get what there's. I, I get it. The tax, the yep. cap, the, the the maneuverability. I get it. I just think we're likely going to end up in a scenario where the Warriors are sitting here without a better option, because for for the most part, the thing that people uh, say when they talk about moving on from Clay Thompson, quite frankly, you're asking for something that doesn't exist. Like, okay, you don't want 18 points per game for $20 million. Okay, what is it that you even have to spend on the open market? And who is that person that you're going to go get that's going to do a better job of those things and is younger and, and, and better on both ends of the floor? I don't think that exists. So whether they want to or not, I feel like the Warriors are probably going to get to a spot where they're like, eh, it's kind of our best option with that roster spot. Is Clay Thompson? Yeah, it depends or, on what the number is. I mean, I I don't think you're wrong, but and I just looked to make sure it's 172 is the the threshold before you go over the tax. The luxury tax, 172, and right now without Chris Paul, you're at 144, and that includes GP2 opting in for nine million. Kavon's on the books for eight million. It's but, not fully guaranteed. That's no Clay though. That's no clay. That's no clay. Okay. That's, so you've got about twenty eight million underneath the uh, the tax to fit clay in, and that's I mean Kavan would free up some, assuming that he is no longer here, which his eight million is not fully guaranteed. I think it's a two million dollar guarantee of the eight. So if you say goodbye to Kavan Looney, which I think that they're probably going to do, as hard as it is to say that, because yeah. we love Kavan. Yeah. CP three will be gone. Uh, Sharich is not under contract. He'll be gone. And then you don't have a first-round pick to pay unless you somehow land in the top four of the lottery if you end up being a lottery team. Long way to say, yes, they could bring back Clay Thompson for about 25 to $30 million, but then do nothing else. So then you're looking at really just running this thing back. Minimum contracts. Without too. Chris yeah, Paul. Filling in roster spots with minimum exactly. contracts. Yeah, no, I don't think that they're going to do that. And I think that you're, the point you make is a good one because if you don't sign Clay, then you've got about 25 or $30 million to spend. What are you going to go out there and get that is even as good as, if not better than Clay? I just wonder if this conversation, I, I would hope not. I, I would hope that these two sides have the utmost respect for one another. And I would think they do. He wants to stay with the Warriors. But that whole conversation of like, you know, if you're the Warriors, you're like Clay. Like we, we need to be able to fill out this roster. Um, you know, this is what we can do. We can do twenty three million this year. You know, we can do a two year forty six million dollar contract. And someone else is out there offering thirty million a year. And Clay could be like, But they're 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 offering thirty. And the Warriors are like, Right, but you understand our situation. And he's like, But you understand my situation. You know, you don't want to disrespect me. I mean, don't the Warriors at some point get to the the opinion where they're like Dude, we gave you a max contract in the hospital. Right. Knowing that you weren't going to play. You got paid so much money to not play. You stood up on a stage and said, dude, who does that? The Warriors paid me to rehab. Who does that? Well, the Warriors do. I would hope the conversation never gets there. But I just look at one of these where it's like two sides who both kind of have a point. So you might as well meet in the middle and keep doing it. 
You might as well meet in the middle and keep doing it. That that's that's to me that's got kind of, that's the final analysis. I hope in the end for these two sides. Yeah, meet in the middle though is not possible if you're talking about staying under the tax. Possibly, depending on what another team would offer Clay Thompson, and we don't know what that would be. And it might be a question of years too, because Steph only has two more years. Draymond's got three more years. So if you give Clay. Two more years, he would be coterminous. His contract would end at the same time as Steph. Or you give him three and hope that Steph sticks around longer, which I would figure that he would. He's got another baby on the way, for crying out loud. The kid's got to work. So (laughs) I I really wonder how that's going to all work out. And in the meantime, we are staying in the present. we got a big Laker game tomorrow. And these next four games, and you mentioned it, nine days. Nine days from now is the 9-10 play-in game. And we might be down to the final nine or ten days of Warrior basketball this year. The Warriors are very, very likely to be in it, and they are very, very likely to be an underdog in it. Yep. There you have it. Yep. That's the but, but, and that's why I say that tomorrow I will watch tomorrow night's game with a little bit of a different eye. That's the other thing we got to with Warrior basketball and certainly can weigh in on this, 888-957-9570. I'll say it up front. I'm not rooting against the Warriors tomorrow night. I'm not calling for a tank. I don't think they should go lay down, rest their players. I would never root for the Warriors to lose for the Lakers, even if there was actually something bad on the line. I think until you are knocked out of the eight seed or even the nine seed, until you are, you go for it because you don't know what's going to happen around you. I don't know if there's going to, right? I don't know if there's going to be a massive injury for the Kings or the Pelicans. And maybe they do go on a three game losing streak. I don't know. Um, maybe that that that's on the table. So you play hard and you play hard until the end. But if the Warriors lose the basketball game tomorrow night, I do think there's a decent chance that that is not, shall we say, the worst thing in the world because it would help the Lakers in their chase for the eight seed. And I think the advantageous position for the Warriors right now their most likely path to the playoffs, which should be the focus, is to play the Sacramento Kings in game one and hope that the Lakers beat the Pelicans in the 7-8 game, if that's who ends up in it, by the way. We're acting like the Suns aren't a part of this picture, and they are. But quite frankly, I would rather play the Suns. I would rather play the Pelicans. I'd rather play anyone but the Los Angeles Lakers. That's not fear. That's not saying the Warriors can't do it. That is admitting that that matchup, based on size and the different people on the floor and a guy named LeBron, is just not the best matchup for the Warriors. And I think it's been proven. It's kind of funny to me that anybody would argue with this. Look at the way they've played them this year. Look at the playoffs last year. Just look at it. That that arena has been a house of horrors for Steph Curry's shot. Like, it's just, it's what it is. And if the Warriors can avoid it, avoid it, phenomenal. Yeah. I'm all for it. And I'm with you. And I would like uh, Sacramento, too, in that first game because Sacramento, to me, is the most vulnerable. And they're in a spot where they actually might they might slide down on their own at the Thunder tomorrow. And they've got the Pelicans and the Suns before wrapping it up against Portland, which you would figure is a gimme victory for Sacramento. But the three games before that, you've got three games in four nights – at OKC, back home for the Pelicans, and then the Suns on the back-to-back. Both the Pelicans and the Suns are going to be playing for something, too. So is OKC. They're right. a game behind Denver and Minnesota, so you're right. It's not just good teams. It seems that are playing for something. And at an OKC, and you turn around two days later with a back-to-back at home, you can see the, the Kings maybe going 1-3 and three in that stretch, considering how undermanned they are. And a 1-3 and three Kings combined with a 2-2 two and two Lakers... And all of a sudden, the Lakers jump over Sacramento. Boom. Yeah.